everybody to the panel called yeah. Creating Worlds. Yeah. yeah. have a discussion today about bringing life to games, movies, and books. Thank you to everyone joining us on the stream on Twitch. You're not here, and that sucks for you, but thank you so much for everyone to, who's in this room and who came to join us today. We have a fantastic panel up here, as you can see. We have quite a few voices from a spectrum of different types of media. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Reiner, would you like to kick off uh, the introductions and we can just kind of go down the table? Who are you? Oh, <laughs> my name is Andrea Renee. Um, I work in video games media. Uh, some of you might know me from GameStop TV. Um, I host there and a variety of other places. My fearless co-host here is Mr. Jeff Keeley. I don't think he really needs an introduction, but if you if haven't seen, if, yeah, if, if I was to give you an introduction, you don't get enough I would say he's the executive producer and host for the Game Awards, the fantastic presentation that celebrates the best and brightest in video games. Uh, coming back this fall, yes, Jeff? Coming back December 1st, tune in. There uh, we go. Live on Twitch and YouTube and everything. Um, and yeah, we got an awesome panel uh, with us here. Some really awesome folks. Uh, some you may know, some you may not know. Uh, some of the finest uh, developers from Bethesda and some special guests. We're going to have them all introduce who they are, uh, and then we'll get to our topic at hand, which is creating worlds, not just in games, but in all the different mediums. Uh, and we'll start right here with a uh, familiar face to many of you if you read Game Informer magazine, the one and only Reiner. Yeah, by day I am uh, executive editor of Game Informer magazine. I've been doing that about 20 years. Uh, that's monthly deadlines all the time. You can never miss it. <laughs> it's hell on earth. Uh, but by night, uh, I've recently become a sci-fi author. Uh, released a book called Prime Genesis Series Event, and the second book is coming later this year called Splice. So that's me. Scott. Hello, everybody. Uh, Scott Porter. I am not a creator, uh, but I do voiceover work. Uh, I don't create worlds. I just you kind create of characters. create characters that exist within the worlds. Uh, I've done voices in like Ark of Night or a lot of Lego games and a lot of Telltale games, as well as uh, being an actor on TV as well. So uh, I guess we'll get into the collaborative process and questions later. But uh, that's me. Then what Bethesda game do you want to be in, Scott? Fallout. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Rick Malambri. Uh, I'm an actor as well. Uh, more TV film, but transitioning into voiceover. Um, so yeah, I've been in Step Up 3, Step Up franchise, uh, a film called Surrogates with Bruce Willis, and a TV show called The Lion Game for for ABC Family. So Where did they shoot that? Here in Dallas. Uh, hi everybody, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your time. I'm Harvey Smith, I'm the co-creative director at Arcane, along with Rafael Colantonio, uh, I was co-creative director of Dishonored 1, and now I'm uh, creative director of Dishonored 2. Um, uh, yeah, my plane was late, uh, or I was late for the plane, I had one of those. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I really missed, uh, I really regret missing the first day because it was like the world premiere of the Corvo gameplay, and uh, I heard everybody loved it, but I wanted to be there to see the reaction and feel it in the room and all that, but I was a day late, so I couldn't. Um, anyway, uh, we're hard at work on Dishonored 2, and I'm here, the, Dishonored 1 was made between uh, a team in Austin and a team in Lyon, but Dishonored 2 is entirely in Lyon, and so I'm on French time right now, and uh, that's one of the reasons why it was hard to get here. If you miss a plane and you're coming from Europe, you're fucked. <laughs> uh, my name is Hugo Martin. I was the creative director on Doom, and I'm at id Software still right now. You guys like Doom? Hey everybody, my name is Ricardo Baer. Uh, I work at Arcane Studios as well. I'm the lead designer on Prey, and uh, before that I worked on Dishonored, and also uh, by night I wrote a couple of fantasy novels that probably no one has ever heard of. <laughs> Let's hear of them, what are they, what are they called? <laughs> uh, the first one's called Jack of Hearts. Uh, it's a seven chord series. Ooh. Yeah, Ricardo left. Ricardo's leaving out a detail. He also worked on Deus Ex with me back in the day. So, like. Oh. 
and gentlemen. Um, oh, thank you. So we have a, quite a variety of different creative experience. We have some people who bring characters to life, some people who write characters. But let's start with you, Reiner, talking about your experience working specifically on your novel. Um, Building the world of a book is quite different than building the world in a video game. And as somebody who works in video games, uh, you know, you have a very long career doing that. What to you were some of the biggest challenges when you started your book, knowing, you know, kind of the experience that you have, seeing the creativity behind video games? Yeah, it's, it's something I've never done before, but I've always wanted to. And uh, I should just preface this first. I have a, I create all of my, my fiction with a co-writer, Chris Cluey, who used to be a, a Minnesota Viking. Uh, he's now in writing. Never, ever, if you get the chance to write a book with a punter from football, never do that. Uh, <laughs> it's a bad idea. But uh, he's my creative partner, and we just really gel well. But we didn't know what we were doing. Like We were getting into this. But I did have 20 years of experience of going to studios like Arcane and stuff like that and getting to see these creators uh, talk about their processes. So I learned kind of some of the, the mechanics they had and kind of brought that forward into when we started creating uh, our books. And it really, it all starts with that idea of just, wouldn't this be cool? And from there, you just, you just kind of build it. And for us, it was, wouldn't it be cool if there was a, sh a, a living shark on the planet that was a detective that had, had a human brain, <laughs> and he solved crimes, but he gave, he, every once in a while, he gave in to his animal instincts. That isn't the idea we ended up going with, but that's spawned. <laughs> there was a little atom in there, a little nucleus in there that spawned an idea, and we started going into biohacking and how this creature could exist in our planet, and that gave way to this huge universe, and from there, it was just all world creating and character creating. But what does that mean for you when you say world creating? Like, what does that look like? Where do you start? Are you, are you writing out a paper timeline? Are you creating a spreadsheet? Um, are you putting post-it notes on the wall? It, it was all that, actually. <laughs> yeah, we were drawing maps. We were going crazy. We were like, can we make our own language? That was a really bad idea. <laughs> but uh, it, it really started with a character. And that was kind of a Dr. Frankenstein-like character for us that would be making these these creatures, these, and basically everyone that has read the book says it's like Jurassic Park in space with aliens instead of dinosaurs. And, you know, we never really thought about, about that when we were making it, but that's what it kind of boiled down to was just creatures eating people is basically what it was. But, uh, yeah, it all started with that character and fleshing him out and then growing the universe around him. Like, what would he need to be able to do this stuff? Cool. So for the developers on the panel, for Ricardo and Hugo and Harvey, you guys obviously have a different kind of process for creating a world in a video game versus a book. Where, where's kind of like ground zero for you? Like where do you as a team come together? Is there like one person who kind of is like, I'm going to start it and then the whole team kind of chimes in? Or is it all a group effort from the beginning? Anyone who wants to answer, go ahead. Um, I think it's a group effort from the beginning because uh, you could certainly drive the conversation given you know my role in the studio, uh, but you really it, it works a lot better when you have other people involved and they they really understand what it is that you're striving to make and you try to come up with like key words that kind of guide the creative process. That that's a, a really useful tool that we use. Uh, you pick three words that describe the thing you're trying to create uh, the best. That that works for both individual assets like a mech or a robot or something but also like the overall uh, tone of the project that you're working on. So once you do that, then, you know, you bring people in because they have unique perspectives on things and, you know, everybody's, this guy's more into these type of games and this guy reads these type of books. So you, you try to bring people together so that way you can have like a, the, the best ideas flowing around, flowing around the room. Um, and then uh, I like to do uh, post-it notes. I'm really, uh, post, uh, what do you call them? Note cards. I'm, re I'm really big into that. So you just, it's almost like a you, you, anybody has it like, oh, wouldn't it be cool? Like the guy walks into the church and he Sorry. cocks a shotgun and, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like white doves part and stuff like that. Well, that could be like just you write that down as like a scene uh, and you put it up on the board and you have a collection any of the game concepts, mechanics, story moments, uh, just ideas for even end credits, like anything. And um, you just, then you start to organize it. You almost do like an American Idol, like which idea is not going to last uh, on the board. And it's really fun. It's, it's a, coll a collaborative process. I think the more people involved, the, uh, the, the more your chances of success increase. I think it goes without saying, if you have a phone, you should probably put it on silent. Jeff. Jeff <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much for that. I didn't quite get that. Shut it, Siri! I'm on a panel! <laughs>
<laughs> she doesn't care. <laughs> she wants to meet you, Scott. She liked your oh, beatboxing. Sorry, sorry. Um, so for you guys uh, on the game side, obviously, uh, let's talk about collaborating and creating worlds too, because obviously it's, a, you know, game making is such a collaborative process. It's not just sort of one auteur says, here's the game I'm making, we're done. So tell us about the team and the, the process of collaborating. How do you guys, or everyone has different ideas. How do you sort of bring those together? Because um, worlds are, are very much co-authored. And even on the first Dishonored, Harvey, like you and Raf sort of, shared the creation with the team or how would you describe that process? Um, yeah, so uh, I have to say I, I wrote a novel called Big Jack is Dead. It's semi-autobiographical and th one of the most interesting things about it was seeing how different it is to work solo versus to work with a large team where you're trying to do what he was talking about, getting all the best ideas, getting everybody bought in and invested in what you're doing. So those two things are just, they couldn't be more different uh, night and day and strengths and weaknesses to both. But um, to answer the question more directly that Je Jeff asked, um, it's really hard to share that space with people. And Raf and I have known each other for a very long time. We've been working side by side for like the last eight years. And uh, even then, there were moments where it was just like super empowering to have this guy who could, he could finish my sentences by the end of the project and vice versa. But it was also, we almost killed each other at different points. You know, it was just very, both of us very strong-willed about some tiny detail, like and not quite the color of the curtains in, the, in a room, but like, you know, that level of like going nuts over, over a particular issue. And we like to think that we covered each other's weaknesses and played to each other's strengths. And then it was a positive thing. Um, and we were both better at motivating different parts of our team, and I think that helped too. Uh, but one thing I just want to add, and then I'll, then I'll stop and turn it over to somebody else, is that, like in the case of me and Ricardo, we've worked together since like 1997. And it, I've said this before, but like you hear terms a lot like creative chemistry, and you don't really know what it means because like people say it and you kind of get what it means, but until you feel it, it, it you know, in, in my case, it's like I eventually came to understand that what creative chemistry meant to me was I really like this person. I know them really well. We've already gotten to the point. We've been close enough where we've had to get through some difficult stuff. We've gotten to the point where we know how to argue. I know what his weaknesses are. He knows what my weaknesses are. And at the end of all that, I still like working with him, and so we, we like, you know, That's good. kick ideas back. <laughs> we kick ideas back and forth until they're better. We're willing to cut stuff. We're willing to attack each other's ideas. Um, Harvey's kind of like my Sith master. I have, I have to kill him <laughs> at some point. Not too advanced. It's, yeah. it's a bummer. I, I do have a good example. I think of um, the way that working on a game uh, on a specific idea, how like a bunch of different people on the team. Uh, sort of like transform an idea to what its uh, final product ends up being. So uh, raise your hand if you've played Dishonored. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Those okay. of you who didn't raise your hand, please leave now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how many of you guys know the character Granny Rags? Yeah. Okay, so that's a really good example of how like that wasn't just like one person's vision. Um, it was like a collaborative effort with, from lots of different people, level designers, artists, uh, Harvey and Raph. I think it started uh, kind of like what you were describing a second ago, Hugo, with just like an image, like an idea of like, what if there was this woman, like we were, we were trying to think of what's the tone of the city, the feel of the game. What if there was this woman who was like blind, like a homeless lady, and she thought she was feeding pigeons, but in reality they were rats, you know? And then, and then that turned into like a level designer took that and was like, you know what, maybe it's connected to the mission. What if she's like, this homeless lady wandering around and uh, she's got a rat, I mean a cart that's full of all the like trash and stuff that she's picking up and the player can like ride in the cart and use that to sneak in. That idea never made it into the game. But then I think like some artists and like Harvey and Raph got a hold of that idea and they were like what if instead of a homeless woman she's like, she's actually an aristocrat who's like fallen because she made contact with the outsider and now that's what, that's why she's batshit crazy now. Um, and then that came back to the level designers and it turned into like this cool quest where she's asking you to do these like pretty shady things, but she's also gonna give you magic powers if you do them. Um, and in the end, she turned into this like really amazing character and you know, in the hands of the artist, it turned to the concept art for her town turned out to be like really evocative and spooky and cool. And don't forget Susan Sarandon voicing the character. Yeah, and then Susan Sarandon like interpreting the character and doing an awesome job. And then Austin Grossman wrote some of the lines. Yeah. I wrote some of the lines. I think you did too. I just have to add to all of that. That is a great example. But um, 
along the way, I'm always telling people like, and other people say this too, like don't, if you're making a video game, don't just draw from video games as your examples. Uh, there's a documentary called Grey Gardens, and it's about two fallen aristocrats in New York State. And it is really fascinating. If you haven't seen Grey Gardens, you have to see it. And one of them was, in some ways, our inspiration for, just imagine someone who's lost everything. There's like literally a hole in the roof and rain comes to it. But they were once super wealthy and super well-known. And uh, their, their fashion shows it. It's, it's cobbled together from uh, the wreckage of a former life, but they still carry themselves like an aristocrat. And so there were inspirations. A lot of people here probably know Grey Gardens. Raise your hand if you know Grey Gardens, really. Three of you. Three. Excellent. Four. Ooh. Five. Okay, that's Everyone cool. else, get out! <laughs> 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 it's, it's interesting what he said because uh, we were having this conversation at, at uh, it yesterday, and I think it kind of relates to maybe the, the actor the actors training. But uh, I took an improv class, and one of the keys to it is you can never say no to your partner. You always have to say yes because you want to keep you want to keep going right. until you build to something that's really like awesome. So when you're going through that creative process, it's important to like not say no. You know, I mean, some, at some point you, you you know you may have to, but it, it's kind of a last resort. I think you because you want to finish. The yeah, game. you just want to see. <laughs> yeah, you, you, but you want to see where an individual will go. You know, so it, it's good to just keep saying yes uh, for for a while. It, uh, I, I wasn't very good at improv, but it, it works very good uh, in the studio for sure. So for Rick and Scott, you come into the creative process. You know when most of that original creativity is actually like pretty far along down the line and you guys are really responsible for taking what has been built for you and then interpreting it in your own way. What are some of the um, kind of rituals that you guys have when you get like a new script for the first time or you're meeting a character for the first time? What's like, what do you do first? Read it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. I mean, a lot of, a lot of our creative You process. can read? <laughs> I, people just tell me what to say and then I repeat it. Um, no, go ahead. no, a lot of our process is reading and research and, and figuring out what that character, I mean, we get a lot of scripts and then we have to figure out, first of all, whether we like it or not, and then if we relate to it. And once we relate to it, we build a character from ourselves out to that character. And like you said, we are the end process of the creativity. But we're also, I feel like, the puppets of the director and the producers and everyone else because they are the ones that create this initial vision and then we bring that to life with ourselves and what the character is. Um, Do you yes. find that you get to have a collaborative process at all though? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, sometimes you're playing a character who's steeped in lore and has been around for 80 years, like Nightwing and Batman. I mean, you, you know who Nightwing is, or if you don't know, you do your due diligence and you research that character. I, I played Cyclops, I hated Cyclops as a kid. I thought he was a stick in the mud, and then once I was cast to play Cyclops from the X-Men, I did research and figured out what made him tick, and now I fucking love the guy. <laughs> but, you know, then there's Telltale Games, and I was in The Walking Dead, uh, I played a character named Luke in Walking Dead Season 2, and he appears in the first chapter, and he's pretty much, it was a blank slate, and, you know, that was very collaborative, because, you know, how does he speak as long as the writers aren't incredibly precious with their words, and sometimes they have to be, because sometimes the writers are the only ones who know the language of that world, uh, and you can't change a thing. But no. sometimes, <laughs> when you're playing a, you know, kid with a gun in the South during the zombie apocalypse, then you can kind of, as an actor, try, you know, form his, uh, you know, language as well, um, which is really cool. And then, in Minecraft, I was the second actor in on a character named Lucas, and the first iteration of him tested so poorly that we went back to the drawing board and built him from the ground up to try and make him more likable. And uh, I was able to, to have a lot of say in that. So as an actor, it's just you kind of have to gauge how much you really can give to the project when you come in. Sometimes it's already set in stone and it's so perfect already. Uh, and sometimes it's a, it's a little lump of clay and you get to play a little bit more. But uh, you know, it varies, but it's really cool to, to at least feel like you're a part. It's empowering as an actor to feel like you're a part of that last minute collaboration. Yeah. Do you guys ever do uh, hands-on sessions with your VO artists when you're ready to go into the yeah. booth and 
do you find that you enjoy that collaborative process or That's, do you find it frustrating sometimes because they're not <laughs> kind of delivering the way that you had envisioned it? You're ruining my vision! <laughs> yeah. oh, we were saying uh, before that like that is one of my favorite parts of the process actually is uh, taking this, you know, I've just been like typing dialogue for like months <clears throat> and then finally getting to go to the studio and like have someone like speak the words out loud. Um, is both illuminating and super fun and oftentimes we change things on, I mean not often, I mean almost every single time, we change things on the fly because we realize this thing that I said sounds really dumb when spoken out loud and oftentimes the actor is the person who like will suggest like, hey what if I just shorten this or leave this part out or they just say it in a way that's more natural and then we like put that back into the game because it worked better. Yeah, sometimes I wish we could record that entire process if it wasn't so sloppy and crazy and would make people think we, we should all be fired because at the last minute I'm, we're texting each other, here's a line to add, you know, we forgot this. Yeah. Uh, and games like ours have many states and many variability, uh, much variability, right? Like where, oh yeah, if you're Corvo, not Emily, and in high chaos or very high chaos and you killed Paolo, then like we have to have all of this coverage and so at the last minute things will occur to us. Um, but sometimes I wish we could record that process because uh, I have to say, not just because you guys are here, the actors are brave in a way that, I mean, I, you know, we're all brave in some way, right? But the actors are brave in a way that I'm not brave. And uh, for them to just go out on a limb and often we'll say things in the booth like, okay, look, this is what we want you to try. And most of them <laughs> take a deep breath and they dive in even if it sounds crazy. And very often we get really good results from that. People come in, they bring their personalities, uh, they bring their, their past work, uh, they listen to you, they try to find, it takes a while to dial it in and then they, once you, once you, it doesn't always work out and it doesn't mean the actor is the wrong actor for the, uh, for the part or whatever, it's just like sometimes the chemistry is not there, but we've had people just come in and like within seconds we're like that's the person, we've had people work at it for an hour, uh, remember when we, when we, I think you worked more with her than I did, but the lady, or the woman that played Lady Boyle and her sisters, mm -hmm. Uh, who came in and had read the character her bio and introduced herself and immediately was in character and, and she said something like, uh, it's a pleasure for you to meet me. You know, yes. this kind of oh thing. Oh my gosh, like, yeah, I do remember that. And, uh, it was crazy. It's like she, she, had, she, she was the character before she even showed yeah, up. It was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's funny the bravery thing. I, I agree with that 100% because there are these moments where, like, you're in the sound, the actors in the sound booth, they're like, cordoned off from like the sound director, the technician, and whoever from the team is there, like me or Harvey. And like, you know, the sound, I'll whisper something to the sound of the, the director, like, hey, have them try this. And then they'll relay the information and they'll try it. And then they'll be like, okay, uh, you're doing great. Hang on a second. And then it's just like silent. It's so the fucking shit. worse. <laughs> yeah. Because there's plexiglass and you can see all of them. Yeah, it's like up. if there was glass here and I said something and I can't hear anything you guys are saying and you all start going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. Just one second. <laughs> To tell the truth, most of the time we are totally honest, but there's a reason why we're not talking directly to the actors usually, because, like, we don't know how to do it, right? The, the people, like, <laughs> trash, just tell everybody you're talking people, trash about The people who work with the actors, like, Line Light, they have, like, 15, 20 years working experience working with actors, so we do once in a while, there's a little bullshit, once in a while, <laughs> they'll mute, and I'll be like, God, I love this guy, his voice is so great, but he doesn't understand what a compass is. Somehow, <laughs> somehow in his sheltered life in LA, he's never encountered a compass. <laughs> what do we do? And the, and the director will be like, okay, I got this. Hey man, we gotta redo that last line because of a technical problem. It wasn't you. Your read was perfect. I got chills. I, I still have chills. But the audio technician over here, Bart, fucked up. Bart, come on. And uh, like literally, they will do that. But this time when we do it, I want you to hit compass. Like you know the thing that you use in the woods to like find north. That that kind of compass, not the other kind of compass. And the actor will go, Oh yeah, yeah, I got it yeah, now. Yeah, I got yeah. it now. Oh yeah, yeah, right, right. Okay, got it. Got it. Yeah. So baked, so baked in doing this part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, kind of, that kind of compass. Oh, that compass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh but, yeah, yeah. Yo, no, but honestly, it. it's not usually like that because usually by the time we get into the booth, you know, we're working with people. We're really lucky. Like we're working with people who do a ton of voice acting, 
Uh, and there, by the way, there's an interesting, uh, in creating the character, there's an interesting difference for us in voice actors versus screen actors because uh, with voice actors, you almost always get somebody who is just like, wow. Like we work with April Stewart from South Park and she did the voice of Jessamine, the Empress in the first Dishonored, and the voice of the heart, by the way, and she is a rock star voice actor. She, she can do anything, she's making everybody laugh constantly, she can switch gears, you give her a little direction, she just runs with it. And then we work with screen actors, and sometimes they have an amazing presence, especially on camera, but they don't have as much experience as the straight up voice actors. And so, but anyway, by the time you get to the booth, usually all those kinks have been worked out, and so there's nothing really heinous. Like once in a while, there's a, there's a misdirect. It's usually related to the lore of the game or something in the context of the game. But very little of that actually happens on our side. But. One last thing. One, uh, sometimes though, as a screen actor, you go into the booth and you get to play a character. I think you guys worked with Derek Phillips, who played uh, Pendleton, Lord Pendleton, in the yes, first game. Yes, Derek is from Baylor. Uh, he went to Baylor. He's from Waco, Texas. He's like 5'2", and, and his normal voice is very, yeah, you know, I went out to the thing today and I saw the thing, and, and then he gets to play this, like, British aristocrat, like, and, and he just felt so cool because he would never play that role in real life, but right. you guys grant us the opportunity to do things that we'll never, ever do, so. You know, somebody, a, uh, I, I think when, isn't it the Aronofsky? Aronofsky movie, The Wrestler. Some critics said That's about, awesome. uh, yeah, about Mickey Rourke. Once in a while, there's the perfect harmonic between actor and part, and um, the writing for Pendleton was mostly done by Austin Grossman, who wrote a lot of the dialogue for Dishonored One and Two, and he has a particular tone of voice. Like if you read any of his books, he wrote You, and uh, Soon I Will Be Invincible. That's my favorite of his novels, I think. Uh, he has a new book that mixes Richard Nixon and Cthulhu. He's a really interesting writer. Uh, <laughs> he also, he also uh, worked on the original System Shock, so he's got a long history with games as well. But anyway, he wrote most of Pendleton. And uh, your friend who came in, just like, immediately we were like, holy cow, this is like, this is like Austin's writing and voice with this guy. It just works, and it's a fan favorite. So Pendleton, even though he's like a slimy snake aristocrat and Dishonored One, man, people love that guy. So yeah. yeah. I was gonna ask uh, uh, Hugo a bit about um, inheriting a world. So something like Doom, obviously, uh, you know, created many years ago, but then you're sort of building on top of it. Can you tell us a bit about you know the sort of the limits of that creativity or where you feel you can go when you're already inheriting a world that has so much of a legacy to it? It's, um, it's, how you build on top of it? Uh, it's funny, people have asked me that in interviews, like, did you feel limited or how do you work around the limitations of working on a, a pre-existing property? I think that Doom felt limitless. I mean, the, the <clears throat> it's just this huge IP that, that really kind of anything goes, uh, as long as the tone was right, you know, uh, and it was about demons and, and shotguns. But, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, it, we always said that the, the characters in the world of Doom kind of look like something a 15-year-old would draw in the back of his notebook during math class. So that, that as a premise means it's pretty wide open, you know. Uh, but the tone had to be right, so so the only thing I guess that was somewhat limiting, but it was it was a good place to be because it's a very B movie kind of Evil Dead, two ish sort of a, a tone that that anybody you know who doesn't like that you know it's it's really fun and uh, and freeing you can have humor but it's like lots of guts and gore and stuff. We kind of called it a popcorn horror, which is sort of horror for the whole family, and um, it, it's it, yeah it, it was it, once we figured out the tone, then we could just kind of build it up through there, you know, did the pieces fit together and when they all came together did it feel like a Doom game? And a little bit of trial and error in there, trial and error. I think uh, some of the stuff, like the narrative, was hard simply because uh, it's a Doom game and you didn't really want to have a certain type of, it, it, it required us to have a certain type of narrative and, uh, and that was just something that the brand kind of seemed like that's what it wanted. <clears throat> but for the most part, we got lucky with Doom because it's, uh, it, it, it's a pretty crazy world, so you don't, it doesn't feel very limiting at all. Let's talk a, a little bit about how these different forms of media intersect. Since everyone up on stage here has kind of dabbled in a little bit of everything, and we're in such a crazy period of time where multimedia, it's like, 
it's almost like every property now has a comic book and a movie and a TV series. Um, what is the kind of creative process when you have to work uh, in multiple fields? Andrew, have you ever thought about taking your IP, your book, and, and kind of diversifying it across a different spectrum of yeah. media? Yeah, we've we've actually had. Uh, if I can talk about this, but I will. Uh, it's, it's not like it's on the internet or anything. <laughs> yeah, we've had it's people, just the people in this room. Yeah, we've had talks about maybe making it into a screenplay, adapting it uh, into film, and uh, and then also doing audiobooks and stuff like that. Um, so uh, it's weird because it's it's a very different medium when you really start to do it, and the whole process is different. Does it scare you, like when you think about, oh, we got to do a screenplay? We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of our book. Plus, we all have—I know you've talked about this in the past—but like, you know, you do all this lore that you never publish, and then how do you boil it down to two hours and make it work? Or does it end up being Jupiter Ascending? <laughs> <laughs> Which would make a great video game property. <laughs> Wachowskis. I was in Speed you were Racer. In Speed Racer. They're, fucking what are you brilliant. Doing? They're brilliant, but it was just so big. That, anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It's like, you, you know, you have a definitive starting point in a book. And in a book, you can kind of ease people into it and let them kind of grow with the characters. Whereas movies, it's very different. They want it to be like something big at the beginning, even though your book doesn't have it. And at that point, you're just like, well, we got to kind of rework this whole thing. Like these characters, these arcs need to change. Uh, so in that process, yeah, it's it's difficult. It's very strange, and uh, uh, but it's it's also rewarding at the same time. And one thing that I want to echo uh, that you guys, um, Harvey and uh, Ricardo, were talking about about collaborating with someone else. You know, for years, I would say like 20 years, I've tried to write books on my own. How many of you out there have tried writing stuff or making your own games? And then how many of you gave up on the project? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing, you get so in your head, and like I'm talking now, like you, you, you start having these problems, and even though you think you're doing something cool, you start second guessing yourself and stopping it. And props to you, Harvey, for finishing your book. Like, I've tried, like, I probably have like 20 different manuscripts that I just get to chapter six or seven. You want to know my secret? I was fired and I was unemployed. <laughs> But when you have a creative partner like that, that can help you, a second voice that can help you, or dev teams with hundreds of voices, that is so vital. So if you've started something and you think it's good, and you can find, like you guys were talking about, this creative partner that you can share these visions with, it's such a rewarding thing. And, and like you were saying, like, never say no. There was a point with Chris and I where we wrote an outline for our first book. We wrote an outline in four days which is pretty fast for writing a book outline. We didn't know what we were doing. You know, we didn't look anything up on the internet. We were just like, this is our story, it's kick ass. And then uh, we realized we left so much space for us to create these characters and have side characters and side stories that I would submit a chapter to Chris and he'd be like, oh, this is really cool. And then he'd submit a chapter to me. We'd write chapter to chapter to chapter. And then he'd kill a character that I just created. <laughs> so I'd be like, what the hell, man? This is fucked up. Like, I put my life into this guy. Like, I spent days on this, and you just murdered him. And he's like, well, he doesn't fit in this capacity. So you got to have this give. But what we ended up doing then for the second book. I thought you'd never say no. Isn't killing a character like, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> What we ended up doing is not saying no and creating more uh, thorough outlines. With the second book, our outline took six months. <laughs> this so. is your opportunity in the next chapter to bring him back to life. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's Dracula. Yeah, Violet can it's do like, anything. It's like super <laughs> passive aggressive writing. <laughs> this character just keeps dying and coming back to life and dying. At breakfast, you take the last egg McMuffin, and he's like, oh, that's cool, yeah. And then you get that chapter that night, and you're like, wait, Jacob's dead? What the fuck? <laughs> he's just like, yeah, take the, take the egg McMuffin next time. So you were telling me, Scott, I'm just curious, you were telling me today, we won't reveal the game, but you went into a recording booth and found out that one of your characters was dying that day as you yeah. were in the booth. Yeah. What is that discussion like? Uh... Yeah, the, yeah. No! <laughs> I, why? That was the first thing I said. I was like, why? And then I'm realizing I'm not coming back for the next session that I thought I was getting paid for. No, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's tricky. You know, it's the great thing about, you know, 
the actor side of it is that it doesn't matter if it's on screen, on stage, in a, in a booth. Our goal is to just kind of base the one character that we're playing in whatever reality we can grab hold of. Uh, I met Sean Penn once and he's a very intense dude. And I tried to like compliment him. I was like, dude, dead man walking. He goes, let me stop you. If I don't know what good acting is, how can you know what good acting is? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I was like, you don't, you're an amazing actor. He goes, no, I just try and access all my emotions. We're like built of slides is how he said it. He said, we're all built from slide. Like we have a slide of anger and a slide of fear and a slide of sadness. And we just have to not be embarrassed to access that because it's, it's in all of us. And as the actors, it's just you kind of pick what slides you think really work for this character and you try and find whatever anchor you can and then you try and deliver a little bit of reality into this massive world that all these amazing creators have built. I have no desire on being on that side of the camera or that side of the screen because I'm still trying to figure out what the hell I'm doing on my side. Uh, but you know, it's, it's nice to just go in and just try and build this one character. And then you fall in love with the character, and then you go in, and they're like, hey, by the way, yeah, you're falling in an ice lake today, and you're, you're not going to make it. <laughs> I'm like, what? So, I mean, it's heartbreaking, because you, you really, because you build them from the inside out, they kind of become a part of you, and then you're just, you know, the, their fate is not in your hand, but that's kind of the magical part of it as being an actor, because we have to move on to the next character anyway. So to get finality like that sucks, but at the same time, it's like kind of cool, because you know how your character will affect the rest of this world. And my, it, it affected the world that I was in, the character that died, uh, in a huge way. So. I think the whole example of made of slides is really interesting. I mean, I guess it's just a metaphor for, you could say it different ways, but we, always, we often feel like we're trying to activate something that's already in the player. We feel like once we get to this point, we're releasing the game, we're in a dialogue with the, with the players, and so, you know, we're doing Dishonored Comics. The first issue just came out. We're doing a novel. Uh, we're working on the sequel to the game. We did Dishonored 1. We did the Knife of Dunwall and the Brigmore Witches. And as we understood the world, that's a long arc. That's almost eight years of Dishonored stuff mm -hmm. from when Raph and I were just sitting in a room talking about the very, the very first meetings on the game. Mm -hmm. And our, our understanding of the world and the characters got so much better over time. And we're often thinking about, well, and this is true for us, I don't know what the number is, but like the average person who plays through a Dishonored game, they see something like, I, I don't know, I'm just guessing here, but 20% of what is in the game, maybe less. Uh, but we know that someone sees everything. And the thing that works on you might activate something in you that, that you remember based on your experience, and the thing that works on her might activate something else. And so we go into, in terms of bringing it all the way back around to like creating worlds, we go into a great level of detail. Like we recently were talking about the coins in Karnaka, the new city in Dishonored 2, and Dunwall, the original city. And so we have really old coins that are like Empress Jessamine coins that have been in circulation for a long time. We have coins from the Lord Regent time, that brief period of time when he took over the government. Uh, but mostly in the new game, we have coins that have Emily Caldwin's face stamped on them. Hmm. And down in the south, in the, the southern nation, Circonos, we have coins with the Duke of Circonos. And Emily, like one of the themes of the game is like, how you do your job as a leader either hurts people or helps them, right? And everybody who does any kind of leadership role, you do a little of both accidentally or deliberately or whatever. But the coins from Dunwall have Emily's face and they say, Empress protect us, which kind of is like a, a loaded message to Emily. And the coins down in Circonos, where the ruler is the total opposite of what you want in a ruler. He's like a, a demagogue, uh, egomaniac. You know, he, he, he believes that Circonos only has to last as long as he lasts. But the coins say, Circonos for the Duke. And so just those, like, with those few words on a coin, put together by a 3D artist, like made into this object, scattered around the world that the player just sees and loots instantly uh, and spends on more ammo or whatever. We put this detail, this like character building detail into that, knowing that like a huge percentage of people won't even see it. But it, it does come back to that point about like every piece of this from the voice to the music to, to the objects to the coins in the world, I guess we're, we're trying to like activate something in, in, in the player, like some deeper understanding of the world, the character of the world. That's what makes video games like the most engaging storytelling medium around right now, today. It's because you can't put that in a film. You can't put that in a two hour film. I mean, you spend 60 hours to 80 hours to 100 hours in a world and 
you get all of those little bits of lore. I don't know how you guys do it. I really don't know how these guys like do it. I can't keep track of what I had for breakfast today. Uh, <laughs> I mean, sometimes you get these scripts for voiceover that are like this thick with six hundred and fifty pages of words, yeah. and for us, for film, it's like this. So that's well, you know, eighty percent of that though is like. Now you're lit on fire. Now a rat's biting your face. <laughs> now you're getting hit in the head of the club. It's 20, 20 years of, ooh, oh, yeah, exactly. oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. And the you're voice fall, director, you're, you're falling lightly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now you're falling, but now it's like, now you're falling off like a balcony. <laughs> now you're lit on fire and a rat's biting your face while you're falling. Yeah, oh, that was, that was too much. Just Can you give me a fire. second? I just need to figure out how that sounds. <laughs> I'm just gonna go over here. Yeah. Well, we okay, um, that's cool. We'll put you on mute. Yeah. We don't have uh, too much time with. I do want to get to some of your guys' um, questions. I don't know if we have a handheld mic we can use. If not, we can just have you guys come up here and use um, our mic. So if anybody has questions, does anybody have questions? Yeah, if, if you want, you can just stand and say your name and then we'll repeat it for the folks watching at home. Um, I was mostly uh, wondering if, like, because writing a book, you have to create a world, but you also have to tell a definitive story, start, middle, end. Whereas in the games like Dishonored, like, you have to you tell a, a story, but it has, like, a lot of, you know, leeway, like, you, at your studios, you guys try to make a, like, a game that anyone can play and they can tell your own personal story. Uh, what would you guys, like, what compromises would you have, like, writing a book, like, what compromises do you have to make to make sure the story makes good? And making the game, what compromises do you have to do to make sure that all the possible stories make sense canonically, and like things that you have to exit, like uh, leave, you know, things that you have to like not add, things you have to like add you don't want to add. So, what's the biggest compromises from both the games and the books that you guys do? Sorry, everyone else. We're going to answer this question for the next half hour. Um, no, no, I'm joking. We can give maybe a couple of really quick uh, answers because I actually want to hear the Doom answer to this too. But our our answer is um, we kind of deliberately put story secondary, uh, and that's that's hard for us because we love story and we love engaging the players with the world. The narrative itself pulls you along. Um, and I work with guys like Ricardo and nar uh, narrative designer Sashka Duval. Uh, we, we put a lot of effort into it. I don't want to say that we don't. But, uh, but uh, one thing we, we, the reason I say we put it secondary is our main goal is to make an improvisational experience for the player. We want you to be able to combine the powers and the movement and the path you chose uh, and the specific dynamics of, of combat or chase we want you to be able to combine that in a way that we didn't anticipate. You creatively solve a problem and you have that rush feeling. And so we want the best assassination mission possible, right? So we constantly are putting that forward, making changes to make that the best thing, and making the writers play catch up, and then trying to do the best job we can. So we don't, we don't do the thing like a, a Hollywood movie where we fix in stone a script that is the best possible script and make everyone work to that. We kind of do the opposite. We fix in stone what we think within the constraints are the best gameplay and or mission experiences, and then we all try to work toward that. Yeah. And that's, that's, a, that's an example of priority because it's game writing. Yeah, that's a good point. I just want to add one detail to that, which is <clears throat> when we say story, I think a lot of times we're probably th thinking of really of the plot, right? Like this event happens, then this event happens, and this character says this. But we see the story as like a lot of other elements, including the player's own contribution. So like we tell story through like just the objects that are sitting in the room when the player walks in and sees the room for the first time. And then the player tells their own story. Like when you tell somebody about what happened in Doom or in Dishonored, you're telling a story. You're saying, I jumped on this guy's head from the third story, you know, and then this guard hit me in the head and I threw rats on him and, and all oh, that. Rats hit my face. Yeah. <laughs> I was That's, lit on fire. Yeah. <laughs> And the voice actor did a really good job of making the lid on fire sound. But like that's your that's your contribution, you know. I think if you if you set out, I get asked this a lot too. It's like it, if you're if you go into making a game, but you really want to write a book, like you're trying to tell this very specific type of story, and you want to really control the way the the audience how they take it in, you're just going to be limited. I think if you just play the strengths of video games, or uh, then it, it, you don't feel those limitations at all because they're just you're just take advantage of what games have to offer and, and you won't feel like you're limited. 
Yeah, for a book, uh, I think this is something a lot of a lot of writers struggle with, and I know we're we're really new at it. But uh, you have a starting point, and you always hear make the beginning, middle, and end, blah blah blah. But when you start making your story, you want to spend a lot of time with those characters, and it's almost like your arc just keeps ascending. And I think a lot of a lot of writers struggle with this in the capacity of you do got to make it an arc, right? You got to give in to what a book is and sacrifice your vision to a degree and make it fit in that parameter. And you, you know, you could go to a publisher and be like, here's my 7,000 page book. And they're like, make it 300 pages. <laughs> you know, you always have to do that. You got to sacrifice to what a book is. So, uh, you know, I, I'm jealous of like TV writers, you know, that they can go episodic and then go, you know, season to season to season to season to tell a huge story. Yes, you can do series and books, but yeah, you do have to have that beginning by the time they end that book they got to have some kind of conclusion right and the compromise with television is that you have to constantly be putting storylines on hold you can't let your two lead characters who are obviously going to fall in love and be together 60 episodes from now you can't let them get together in episode three because the audience has what they want and they'll walk away so you have these plates constantly spinning and you sometimes end up with filler episodes that really don't do anything, don't move anybody's storylines forward, but have to be there because of this archaic system of, on network television, there's 22 episodes a year, and we need that 22 episode commitment. And you can't, as a group of writers, constantly, I mean, you can, it's just incredibly difficult to keep all those plates spinning while still moving every character forward. So that's a compromise in, in television. It's a constant conflict. Yeah. You always have to have conflict, especially on TV series. And the other, the other thing for us is we created this huge universe. We spent you know, months making this huge thing and you know, just all these crazy aliens and all that stuff. And then realized like, okay, we might only get one shot at this. So we need to tell a definitive story in this one and then grow it from there. Whereas if we knew we had like a five book deal, it would have been probably a very different first book. Does that answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? First person to stand up gets it. Yeah, you won. Slash. You did. You won. Yeah, purple hair. Yeah. Um, so, question for voice acting. Um, I'm an inspiring voice actor, and I was wondering about how you guys come up with the voices that you have to do, or is that completely up to the developers of the game? <clears throat> oh man, it's interesting because there's character actors and there's just actors who use their own voice, and it's, I think a lot of us start out using our, our own voice and, and a lot of a lot of the times we'll go in and we'll do some made up voice and they'll be like, no, 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 we, we want you to do you. We want you to bring yourself to this character. So it's it's by each audition or, or project or whatever we go in on, it's always different. But a lot of the times when we get something to audition for, we have what's called a breakdown and it kind of gives us a backstory on the character and who they are and what they want from us. So we kind of get a, an idea there and then just go from there. Yeah, I mean it's, don't be afraid to use your own voice, first of all. I mean, I don't, look, I don't like my voice on a voicemail message, I hate it, but <laughs> sometimes I get cast because there's just innate qualities in the voice that I have, like Lucas and Minecraft story mode is, it's just me. That's why they cast me. They, they said there's some qualities that they liked in my regular voice. I hate my regular voice, but they liked it for that character. I mean, you can't always, oh, oh, oh what's going on? How are you doing today? Like, there's no place for that in a lot of games nowadays. I mean, it's just like, you know, uh, you know, but like sometimes you just then use your own voice and just modulate it down. When I play Cyclops, I, I put a little bit more bass in it and I give him more authoritative confidence and that's all he needs. It's still my voice. It's just, you know, so don't, don't shy away from that. I know some people have reels with a ton of accents and a ton of different characters and like, you know, slimy alien villains and, you know, growly badasses, but you don't always have to have that. So start out just utilizing who you are and be the best you can be as an actor and comfortable in your own skin. And then everything will spin out from there. But the that's most, where you start. The most important thing as a voice actor is to find the character and, and be that character in every scene that you have to do, whatever emotion you have to bring to that. You have to hold true to that. Not necessarily a voice or, like he was saying, you have to be as vulnerable as possible and continue to carry on that vulnerability through that character. Yeah. 
and be brave, like yeah. Harvey said earlier. I mean, you, in the booth, just try and try and try. They need you need bigger emotion in a sound booth than you do uh, when a camera is right on your face and catching every tick that you have. Uh, now with motion capture, face capture, stuff like that, uh, the performances have room to get smaller, but it's still you still need big emotion because you are reaching through the TV to communicate to the player, not just be speaking to whoever is in front of you. So. Great, great answer. Uh, the young lady in the back who stood up, like a hair after, yes. Um, I'm currently writing for an FLB game, and when I'm writing to build the world, I find myself getting lost in the narrative of the world. Like, I'm writing about the so just so I can repeat, because you're pretty far from the microphone, she asked for the people watching at home, how do you recreate or keep your details together in your open world writing? Right? That's what producers are for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's producers and publishers, and they're just like, hey, Mr. Creativity, you can uh -huh. hurry up with that. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would add that uh, all of those details are actually uh, extremely useful and helpful. They don't all have to be in the game, though. Yeah. So, you know, like for... Um, for Prey, for instance, uh, and we had a similar approach on Dishonored. Like we went, we went back in time, and and when we were thinking of like the world design and building things up, and we were thinking like, okay, so let's we wanted to ground it in the real world. So we went all the way back to like the 1950s and like the space race between like the Americans and the Soviets. Like, oh, the Soviets launched a satellite. Oh yeah, well we put a man on the moon, and so you know they kept trying to one up each other. Um, <clears throat> And that became like tons of cool background lore. And then we started asking like what if scenarios to like tweak the world. Like what if this one detail was different? Like what if Kennedy hadn't, what if he, what if he survived? What if he came back and he like doubled down on the space race? And so there's all this cool lore that spins out of that that we have. But like the stuff that you're going to see in the game is like the tip of the iceberg. But because those details exist, our game will feel like grounded and coherent. Yeah. You, I think you just want to keep it simple too, because uh, th th that saying "keep it simple, uh, stupid" is is a good saying. Because a lot of times, uh, in the beginning, especially, you're gonna your initial idea, you're so excited about it, but it's got a ton of fat on it, and you, and you'll spend like the last half of the project just chiseling away down to only what's important, and then uh, even those details then need to support those few key pillars of of your of, of the message that you're trying to communicate to the player. They can't be like too many separate ideas because they just won't take it all. It's amazing like you watch a movie for the first time and you're going to miss a lot of stuff or play a game. So the, the fewer big ideas you have in whatever it is you're doing, uh, the better usually. And then you can have a lot of details, but they just want to exist in support of those key ideas. Yeah, two quick adds to that. I totally, totally agree with that last point about even stuff in Dishonored that feels a little bit like extraneous detail, it supports the mood. Like early on in Dishonored, you're, you're escaping prison. Mm -hmm. And there are, there's a, there's a place where two people have died, uh, young lovers, and whoever survived uh, the last wrote the note like, this is it, we're, the plague's, we're both sick with the plague, we only have one vial of elixir left. We're gonna split it and just sit down here with. There's a bunch of candles and a wine bottle. Ex exactly, and uh, you know, it's it's not us being uh, wankers or whatever. It's like this. We want to show the human reaction to to the plague, you know. And the other the other point I'll make that I think is very practical, depending on how you apply it, is there's no such thing as too much detail, depending on the medium of delivery. Right? Like, if you're writing notes where the player has to stop, bring up the note, and it's like, war and peace, the lore note. You know, like, like players are going to hate you for that. But on the other hand, if you go into an apartment where a guy's been shot or whatever, and you put like a coffee ring on the bedside table, and you put some, uh, uh, a list of MP3s that he was making into a mix and sending to his grandmother, I, I don't know. <laughs> like you, you do all kinds of things. You look under the bed with a flashlight and you see like the food that he threw under there the night before. Like players love that kind of detail and it's very fast for them to get it because it's visual. So we call it environmental storytelling of course. And like I feel like you can just layer and layer and layer that stuff in. But again, to get back to his point, it has to support the big pillars of the game, 
We have a ton of, it's funny, like uh, one writer, uh, he didn't like that we uh, gave a big descriptions for all the guns. Like if you read the, the codex in Doom, it's, it's, it's like a nerd Bible. That's basically what it is. Uh, it's, it's very D&D, &D, but I, I, we love that stuff. You know, like I want to know who made the bullets and what kind of metal the plasma rifle's made of and, you know, what's this material? Just kind of geek out on it. So we definitely like, it's in the codex. It's not in your way to his point. We're not like forcing you to read this stuff in order to progress. But you're, when you click into the codex and you start doing it, you're, you're basically saying, I want to read this stuff. You know, like I'm down for this. So as long as it's, uh, yeah, it, it still it still has to be in support, like you said, of your, of your big ideas. Uh, you awesome. know, a good, good trick is to uh, practice pitching your idea to people. I do that a lot. Like if you can't give somebody an elevator pitch of your story, then it's probably too long. Like, uh, I'll, I'll do it with Marty all the time. Marty, I guess, blah, blah, blah. Marty Satin is the executive producer on Doom. And I could just tell when he's bored, and I'm just like, okay, I gotta, I gotta keep working on this. <laughs> I have this anecdote right. that I have to share here. Uh, Ricardo and I are good friends with Jordan Thomas, who is the creative director of Bioshock 2, and uh, the Magic Circle uh, is a great guy. He was part of our DVD <coughs> campaign back in the day. And so I went to visit Jordan when he was working on Bioshock 2. <laughs> And I was like, hey, look, let's see. Can we talk about D&D now? Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I have my dice. Um, you know, I was like, you know, we were, I was working on Dishonored uh, or Dishonored 2. I can't remember exactly when it was. He was working on Bioshock 2. I was like out in California visiting him. And I was like, I want to pitch the game to you and the features and all that. And he was like, I want to do the same to you. And he was like, look, out behind the apartment where I live, there's a small mountain. We can take a hike. Uh, on the way up, we'll, we'll tell, I'll t tell you my version. On the way down, you can tell your version. I was like, man, that's epic. Let's do it. So we took off, leaving from his apartment. We walked. He began to tell me the story of Bioshock 2. We like, got halfway across the town toward the mountain. We got halfway up the mountain. He's still going. He's like in the intro. He's describing like you know uh, all the details that Jordan's into. He's that crazy detail mind. We get to the top of the mountain, he's not even halfway through the story. I was like, all right, you know, so we go down the mountain. We completely get down the mountain, the sun is setting. He was like, why don't we walk to this Chinese place I like? So we walked like halfway across the city, we had dinner, and like, he's still telling the story. <laughs> and, like, we got done and was, we went to a coffee shop and I was like, okay, at this point I'm exhausted. Here's the five bullet points of the, uh, of the story. Like, but yeah, it's, it's like the level of detail that you dial in or not depending on uh, and it was fascinating. It was great to hear Jordan's take on what he wanted to do with the game. This is before the editing process and everything, so it was just like blue sky, crazy ideas, everything fitting together, uh, all footnotes, side, side comments about his inspirations and what he was hoping the player would feel. So it was fantastic. I want to be clear about that. But it's like... Uh, you know, there's it wasn't it, the elevator pitch. It was not the elevator pitch. <laughs> yeah. It was the it, mountain pitch. Yeah, right? it was the space elevator pitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we right. the ref, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. No, it's, yeah, that's uh, fortunately we're out of time, but this has been a really uh, fun panel. You guys enjoy it? <laughs>